What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you're having a fantastic Thursday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing I want to talk about today with the week we have had, let's start off a little bit lighter. We have a story, or rather stories, from the past week that have popped up involving women and what they wear with a sprinkling of Hollywood. And one of the first ways we saw this pop up in the past week was a New York Times piece. A piece written by Honor Jones with the headline, Why Yoga Pants Are Bad for Women. Also tweeting out the article saying, Now we have to look hot at the gym? Give us a break. Now in the article, the author even writes, it's not good manners for women to tell other women how to dress. Adding, women who criticize other women for dressing hot are seen as criticizing women themselves. A sad conflation, if you think about it, rooted in the idea that who we are is how we look. But then, as many of the top comments on that article point out, pretty much the rest of the article is, is pointing out what women should and should not wear, and also assuming why women wear what they wear. People saying that seems like a lot of assuming, and it does seem like criticism of the person because we are what we do. We are our choices in life. Saying we aren't wearing these workout clothes because they're cooler or more comfortable. We're wearing them because they're sexy. We may be able to conquer the world wearing spandex, but wouldn't it be easier to do so in pants that don't threaten to show every dimple and roll in every woman over 30? The author's saying she's going to go to the gym in sweatpants. She's going to do other activities in sweatpants. She says other women should too. Saw a lot of women responding, I'm not wearing this to look sexy. Why would you assume that? It's actually more comfortable for certain activities. People saying sweatpants can get hot depending on the activity. So you hop on an exercise bike while you're at the gym, you definitely don't want loose fabric. But at the very least, it seemed like the majority consensus was, hey, how about we don't criticize what other women wear and assume why they wear it? That seems like the most pro-woman thing you could do in this article that seemingly is trying to be pro-woman. So there is that part of the story. Of course, I'd love to know your thoughts there. And then that kind of connects to actually Megan Fox and Jennifer Lawrence in the news. One, hitting how people and seemingly women in Hollywood are just seen as the, these objects. And that then seemingly connecting to the public response of what Jennifer Lawrence was wearing. But uh, uh, here we go. When speaking to E! News this week, Megan Fox got very candid about being an actor in Hollywood. I mean, you're a commodity right? You're something that the studio owns. And so really, as long as you survive filming and they've gotten what they needed from you, they don't really care if you drop dead afterwards. It doesn't matter. Do you, you break an arm, break a leg? And it, you know, things like when you're working, you can get really sick. As long as you're not bleeding from your face, you're going to keep working and people don't understand that. And then in terms of they just, there's no regard for your physical safety or well-being at all because it doesn't matter because you're a, mean, a means to an end. So they need what they need from you, and then goodbye, you know, suck it up, tough it up, and we'll see you for the next one. And on the note of the morally bankrupt industry having no regard for someone's safety, their well-being, essentially just treating them like a commodity, that then connected to the general reaction we saw around Jennifer Lawrence, who was seen in this picture in London for the premiere of Red Sparrow. A lot of the reaction online was that this photo proves how sexist Hollywood is. People saying it's in London, it's so cold, all the other men are wearing jackets, yet for some reason Jennifer Lawrence is wearing this very showy dress. She's gotta be freezing. Some of the specific responses reading, this is such a quietly depressing and revealing image, not least because I've been outside today and it's bloody freezing. True equality means either Jennifer Lawrence getting a coat or Jeremy Irons having to pose for a photo call in assless chaps. At least the guys look really embarrassed. And of course, in response to these criticisms, there were people saying, you need to chill the hell out. It, it, there's nothing wrong happening here. And one of those people was actually Jennifer Lawrence who went to her Facebook to write, I don't really know where to get started on this Jennifer Lawrence wearing a revealing dress in the cold controversy. This is not only utterly ridiculous, I am extremely offended. That Versace dress was fabulous. You think I'm going to cover that gorgeous dress up with a coat and a scarf? I was outside for five minutes. I would have stood in the snow for that dress because I love fashion and that was my choice. This is sexist, this is ridiculous, this is not feminism. Overreacting about everything someone says or does, creating controversy over silly innocuous things such as what I choose to wear or not wear is not moving us forward. It's creating silly distractions from real issues. Get a grip, people. Everything you see me wear is my choice and if I want to be cold, that's my choice too. And if you just look at that post, there were three general responses. Most people were supportive. Some saying she shouldn't have even taken the time to respond to this, but at the same time, when all those articles are going out, it's making every guy in that picture seem like an enemy. They can make them seem bad or at the very least inconsiderate, so she decided to speak out. And some negative, like this comment from Sonny Workman, who wrote, it's not sexist to think your dress was maybe inappropriate for the weather, by the way. Stop virtue signaling and playing the victim. You are no victim. But to that, I would say, I personally agree with Jennifer Lawrence. How many of these people just assume that Jennifer Lawrence was the victim here, that she didn't want to speak up, that she was being taken advantage of before asking, hey, Jennifer, were you okay with this? And as I've mentioned on the show before, when, when you have certain individuals that are outraged 
outraged, almost seemingly at the same level for the little stuff. The stuff, just like in this instance, people just kind of assumed and didn't ask Jennifer Lawrence about. As the really, really big, intense issues, then, then you hurt your argument, you hurt your movement. And so with all of that said, that's the story, that's my opinion, I'd love to hear from you. Are people dying on the wrong hills? Are, we, are, are the reactions that we're often seeing too much? Where do you see the line for we need to have a conversation about women being exploited and just seen as objects in society, but also then not criticizing a woman's choice to look how she wants to look, to dress how she wants to dress, to be her own person. So let me know what you think. And then I want to talk about Linda Belcher and the situation in Kentucky. Now, if you didn't live in Kentucky, you most likely didn't know that this week there was a special election for a House seat. And that House seat was won by Democrat Linda Belcher, who won 68% of the votes in a county which Trump won by 50 points in 2016. And so there were a lot of places reporting this was a major upset. You had people saying, oh, well, look to 2018. This is the change we're going to see. And to those claims, I would say not necessarily. This is an extremely unique situation in Kentucky. We might see a lot of flipping, but while we are close to the 2018 elections, we are also very far away and anything could happen with the polls. Also, it's important to point out that Belcher is not this new face. She actually held this seat in 2008, 2010, 2014. Granted, she ended up losing in 2016, but she lost by less than 200 votes at that time. You also then have to look at who her opponent was then and who her opponent was now. Her opponent was Rebecca Johnson. She was the widow of Dan Johnson, the former incumbent. Also, if that name sounds familiar, it's because we covered the accusations against Johnson in the past, as well as his suicide back in December when it happened. Those accusations, if you don't remember, included fraud, arson, molesting a teenager. That last one you might remember, the girl Miranda Richmond, she accused him of groping and fingering her while she was sleeping over with his daughter. Johnson denied the accusations, claimed that he was drugged that night. And if you want the more detailed version of events, I'll link both to the video where I talked about these allegations as well as two articles that not only talk about this, but also several other allegations against Johnson. And so for all of these reasons, that's why I say this is a very unique situation and, and the story has been overblown by many. And the last thing I'll hit on here, as far as Rebecca Johnson's response to losing, she's claiming she lost due to voter fraud. Saying in a statement, I've heard from people all day long saying they went to vote for me at the correct polling place and were refused the opportunity to vote. It's like we are in a third world country. But to that, the county clerk's office rejected those claims, saying there was no voter fraud. And as of right now, that's where this story ends, but it will be very interesting to see what happens in the elections to come. But from that, I want to share some stuff I love today, and today in Awesome, brought to you by SeatGeek. SeatGeek, of course, fantastic ticket app that takes the confusion out of buying tickets. They put all the tickets in one place. They give them zero to 100 scores, so if you know if you're getting a good deal or a bad deal. And I highly recommend it, whether it's a game, a show, there are a lot of highly anticipated tours right now. You got Justin Timberlake, Kendrick Lamar, or whatever the hell else you're interested in. Just go to SeatGeekPhil.com, make sure you use offer code Phil, and you'll get $20 off your first ticket purchase. And for the first bit of awesome, I'm staying on the Michael B. Jordan train because Michael B. Jordan was on Hot Ones. Damn, we got trailer goodness, and so much of it is from Netflix. I just want to confirm they are not a sponsor. We got a trailer for The Outsiders, starring Jared Leto. We got a trailer for the new Netflix series, Lost in space, which, oh, please don't suck. That said, I'm hopeful. We also got a trailer for Flint Town, so Netflix's new documentary series about the story of Flint, Michigan. Then in non-Netflix awesome, we got the Honest trailer for Monster Hunter World. Also the season five trailer of Silicon Valley. And to close us out today, we got more slow-mo guys awesome. I, I will say they're, they're one of several few. I'm really happy got a YouTube original just so we got more content. They just came out with Paint Pendulum in slow motion. And if you want to see the full versions of everything, I just shared the secret link of the day, anything at all. Links, as always, are in the description down below. And the last thing I want to talk about today are a few more things that we've seen in this fallout since the Parkland, Florida shooting. There are a few things to cover here. The first thing I want to mention is the CNN Town Hall. The town Hall was in Sunrise, Florida. It was all about discussing gun violence. And attending the Town Hall, you had Parkland, Florida community members, students and teachers from Stoneman Douglas, as well as some parents of some of the murdered students. There were also two panels. The first featuring Florida Senator Marco Rubio, Florida Representative Ted Deutsch, and Florida Senator Bill Nelson. And the second panel featuring Broward County Sheriff Scott Israel, the county that Parkland is in, and NRA spokesperson Dana Lash. And I said this last night and I got some heat from it, but I personally do appreciate the fact that Marco Rubio went to this event. I had people saying, you know, just showing up, that's a pretty low bar, but he did not have to go. He could have easily done what the governor of Florida, Rick Scott, did, what President Trump did, and have smaller, more controlled meetings, listening sessions with students and parents. Also understand, while it was called a town hall, this was just a CNN organized event. You can think his responses are horrible, that he is a morally corrupt individual. You can, you can think whatever, but he also still showed up. Like I said last night, that's what we should want from our representatives. There are a lot of people that if they were in Rubio's shoes, they would have not done this. Also, once again, politics aside, I personally appreciated that Rubio spoke out against all those horrible conspiracy theories we talked about yesterday. Once again, that part is just my personal opinion. If you have a different opinion, that is completely fine. If you're new to the show, there are very few places that I'm not open to having a conversation. We learned yesterday, I'm not open to having a conversation about people who share and promote disgusting and obviously false conspiracy theories about victims of a school shooting being 
being crisis actors, and then also people who are soft on child molesters and pedophiles. If you molest a child, I'm personally not religious anymore, but I say the punishment should be biblical. That said, if you did not see the town hall, whether you're on the left or the right, I highly recommend watching it. Now, depending on where you land ideologically, when once you watch it, or if you did watch it, you most likely saw something different than other people. And just in general, I'd love to know what your takeaway from it was. There were a lot of tense moments. One of the more interesting exchanges was between Fred Gutenberg, the father of 14-year-old student Jamie, who was killed in the shooting. Your comments this week and those of our president have been pathetically weak. I absolutely believe that in this country, if you are 18 years of age, you should not be able to buy a rifle, and I will support a law that takes that right away. I will support the banning of bump stocks, and I know that the president has ordered the attorney general to do it, and if he doesn't, we should do it by law. We also then move on to the topic of an assault weapons ban. Now, I think what you're asking about is the assault weapons ban. Yes, yes sir. So let me be honest with you about that one. If I believed that that law would have prevented this from happening, I would support it. But I want to explain to you why it would not. First, you have to define what it is. If you look at the law and its definition, it basically bans 200 models of gun in this country, about 220 specific models of gun. Good, good. Okay. But it makes, but it, but it, rem it allows legal 2,000 other types of gun that are identical. Identical. In the way that they function, in the, how fast they fire, in the type of caliber that they fire, in the way they perform, they are indistinguishable from the ones that become illegal. And the only thing that separates the two types, the only thing that separates the two types is if you put a plastic handle grip on one, it becomes banned. If it doesn't have a plastic handle grip, it does not become banned. And you know what they've done to get right around it? It took them 15 seconds to do it. They simply take the plastic tip off of it. They t just take the plastic grip off the front or the back, so we don't the start. same gun, and it becomes legal performs the exact same way. So what my belief is, my belief remains, that rather than continue to try to chase every loophole that's created, it's why it failed in 94, it's why they're getting around it now in California, it's why how they get around it in New York, is we instead should make sure that dangerous criminals, people that are deranged, cannot buy any gun of any kind. That's what I believe a better answer will be. Then we had senior Chris Grady asking Rubio if he agreed that large capacity magazines shouldn't be banned, and this was Rubio's response. Because I traditionally have not supported re looking at magazine clip size. And after this and some of the details I've learned about it, I'm reconsidering that position and I'll tell you why. Because while it may not prevent an attack, it may save lives in an attack. We also saw Cameron Kasky ask Rubio if he would stop taking money from the NRA. And the positions I hold on these issues of the Second Amendment, I've held since the day I entered office in the city of West Miami as an elected official. Number two, no, the answer to the question is that people buy into my agenda. And I do support the Second Amendment, and I also support the right of you and everyone here to be able to go to school and be safe. And I do support any law that would keep guns out of the hands of a deranged killer. We also had Stoneman Douglas teacher Ashley Kurth asking if Rubio agreed with the president on specifically arming teachers. This is something the president proposed as a possible solution on Wednesday, and, and we'll cover that in a moment. Am I supposed to have a Kevlar vest? Am I supposed to strap it to my leg or put it in my desk? How am I supposed to go on? that way. I don't, and I'm, I don't support that. And I, I would admit to you right now, I answer that as much as a father as I do as a senator. The notion that my kids are going to school with teachers that are armed with a weapon is not something that, quite frankly, I'm comfortable with. Beyond it, I think it has practical problems. And I'll share what they are. And this is really about the safety of the teacher as much as anything else. Imagine in the middle of this crisis, and the SWAT team comes into the building, and there's an adult with a weapon in their hands, and the SWAT team doesn't know who is who, and we have an additional tragedy that was unnecessary. We also then saw a back and forth between student Emma Gonzalez and NRA spokesperson Dana Lash. And for the sake of time, to kind of simplify Lash's point of view, it was mainly that the system is broken. Not that people shouldn't have guns, but we should never allow what she called an insane monster, someone that's mentally deranged from buying a firearm or getting their hands on a firearm. That's someone who the FBI was warned about, that local law enforcement knew about, that the school knew about, was seemingly went unchecked. So much so that in this current system, he was able to buy this weapon and then use that weapon. Also on the note of why someone under the age of 21 should be able to have a long gun, she said for protection. She referenced an assault victim who was under the age of 21, saying that she wished that she had had a weapon on her. But also, once again, I, I highly recommend you watch it. It's very hard, just with a limited amount of time, to really convey everything that was talked about. Also following this event, we saw a bit of controversy. Stoneman Douglas student Colton Hab told a local news station that CNN wanted him to ask a scripted question so he didn't attend the town hall. CNN had originally asked me 
to write a speech and questions and it ended up being all scripted. I don't think that it's going to get anything accomplished. It's not going to ask the true questions that all the parents and teachers and students have. And in response to these claims, CNN released a statement saying, there is absolutely no truth to this. CNN did not provide or script questions for anyone in last night's town hall, nor have we ever. After seeing an interview with Colton Hab, we invited him to participate in our town hall along with other students and administrators from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Colton's father withdrew his name from participation before the forum began, which we regretted but respected. We welcome Colton to join us on CNN today to discuss his views on school safety. And then in response to this, according to the Huffington Post, they spoke with Colton's father. Len Hobbs said that a CNN producer told him Colton's speech, which consisted of an opening statement, three questions, and closing remarks, is too long and that Colton would have to stick to asking one question. So as of right now, that's where we are. It'll be interesting to see if Colton does go on CNN after this. Now, all of that said, Colton Hab actually does connect us to the point I said I wanted to come back to around President Trump. Several days ago, when talking to Fox News, Colton said this. Gun control, it's definitely needed a little bit more. Um, I don't think that we're gonna get gun control in such a quick enough response. Um, I believe that if we did bring firearms on campus to teachers that are willing to carry their firearm on school campus, if they got their correct training for it, um, I think that would be a big beneficial factor into school safety. Just because, I mean, if Coach Feist had had his firearm in school that day, I believe that he could have um, most likely stopped the uh, threat. And what we've now seen is that the president has proposed arming our teachers. That coach was very brave. Uh, saved a lot of lives, I suspect. But if he had a firearm, he wouldn't have had a run. He would have shot, and that would have been the end of it. And this would only be, obviously, for people that are very adept at handling a gun. And it would be, it's called concealed carry, where a teacher would have a concealed gun on them. They'd go for special training, and they would uh, be there, and you would no longer have a gun-free zone. Gun-free zone to a maniac, because they're all cowards. A gun-free zone is, let's go in and let's attack. Now, almost immediately, some people hit him with one of his old tweets. A tweet from May 21st, 2016, where he wrote, Crooked Hillary said, I want guns brought into the classroom. Wrong. And this morning, we saw the president push back in several tweets, saying, I never said, quote, give teachers guns, like was stated on fake news, CNN, and NBC. What I said was to look at the possibility of giving, quote, concealed guns to gun adept teachers with military or special training experience. Only the best. 20% of teachers, a lot, would now be able to immediately fire back if a savage sicko came to a school with bad intention. Highly trained teachers would also serve as a deterrent to the cowards that do this. Far more assets at much less cost than guards. A gun-free school is a magnet for bad people. Attacks would end. History shows that a school shooting lasts on average three minutes. It takes police and first responders approximately five to eight minutes to get to site of crime. Highly trained gun adept teachers slash coaches would solve the problem instantly before police arrive. Great deterrent. Then continuing, if a potential sicko shooter knows that a school has a large number of very weapons talented teachers and others who will be instantly shooting, the sicko will never attack that school. Cowards won't go there. Problem solved. Must be offensive. Defense alone won't work. Followed by, I will be strongly pushing comprehensive background checks with an emphasis on mental health, raise age to 21, and end sale of bump stocks. Congress is in a mood to finally do something on this issue, I hope. Now, the first thing I'll say is, is it does seem like the, the president is just arguing about phrasing. The net result of what he's talking about is guns in schools. Like, his argument is literally, I never said give teachers guns. I said, look at the possibility of giving concealed guns to gun adept teachers with military or special training experience, then saying 20% of teachers. So you're, you're still giving it to teachers, just not all teachers. Also, as far as the president's proposal to raise the age for these weapons to 21, one, and the sale of bump stocks. I, I do wonder what the specifics there would be. I mean, you're talking about a three-year change, so do all the people that currently have weapons, are they are they currently grandfathered in because they already got them, or would that automatically put them on the wrong side of the law? Also, regarding bump stocks, if a law is passed, what about the people that already have them? Are they grandfathered in, or is it also illegal to just own one? Because also, from a tech angle, you enter the world of people that 3D print mods. So will there be a tech or non-tech loophole? It'll be very interesting to see what the proposal looks like. But with all that said, and I know that we've covered so much, much. The, the last question I want to pass off to you is, is what is your thought around this proposal? What is your thought on if a teacher wants to be able to conceal carry in school for the safety of themselves, their students, should they be allowed to? Should it be a built-in option for all teachers in all schools? And really what this question boils down to is just another iteration of are gun-free zones bad or are gun-free zones good? And I'm fascinated to know what your thoughts are here. And that's where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I'm trying to do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. That way you make sure you don't miss these daily videos, which actually if you did miss yesterday's show, you want to catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or maybe you need something lighter, you can watch the newest behind the scenes vlog by clicking or tapping right here. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow, possibly. Just make sure you have your notifications on.